take every bit of time that I can get. I have been wrestling in a totally different way than I've ever wrestled before this past week. And as Eric has said, God has brought me through, and I praise the Lord for it. But I want to not miss the opportunity to praise the Lord for my loving wife as well, who gave everything and did everything she could to help get me through and to to, uh, remind me that my strength is in the Lord. So before I start, I would like to uh, just ask that you would bow with me and let me dedicate myself again to the Lord. great God Almighty, you are an awesome God, the only one, the beginning and the end. You are more than enough, and I want to thank you. I thank you for this message that you've put in my heart. I thank you for the knowledge and understanding that you've given me through your spirit. And I pray now, Lord, that you would anoint me with a fresh coal from the altar of heaven. Touch my tongue, O Lord. Anoint me fresh with your spirit. Speak to me and speak through me that thy children may hear. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to talk to you today about something that I believe is very important to the Seventh-day Adventists in these last days of Earth's history. You know, we've been given a very special message to deliver, and according to the Bible, we are to deliver it to every creature. And we need to understand the foundations of the truths that we actually proclaim. And so, as you'll see today, there is what has been described as a platform of truth. Anybody read about the platform of truth before? Yeah, a platform of truth that we must be found standing on if we are to stand in these last days. You see, we need to understand and be sure of the reliability of the foundation or pillars that hold up this platform of truth. And I believe that by the end of today's sermon, we can have a better understanding of this. And let me just say up front, not because of anyone who is here, but because we are recording to the whole world, that there are quite a few Ellen G. White quotes in this sermon. However, I do believe that the message and visions that were given to Sister White were given from a credible source. Amen? The Bible says in Revelation 19 and 10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so the question is, do you want to know what Jesus has to say about the subject? So with that, we'll go forward. You know that in our series that we've been studying of the three angels' message, I began going forward with the the messages that were given to me by by Pastor Mark. And then they decided to put that in the quarterly. So I thought, well, I would just wrap it up and go over the the verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word study of the three angels' messages. Um, In doing so, as you know, if you was here last I spoke, we ran out of time. And so, uh, we've gone over verses 6 through 8, line by line. I'll read them in your hearing. Revelation 14 and 6 and forward. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the foundations of waters. And his 
And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And now this, my dear friends, is where we left off. Verses 9 through 13, which I'd like to cover today. And so I'll start again, starting with verse 9. And verse, chapter 14 and verse 9, it starts off with saying, Then a third angel, angel followed them. The third angel's message forms the final part of the threefold proclamation of God's last warning message to the world. The first angel calls for true worship, and the third angel warns against false worship. You see, the key issue is that which revolves around worship in these last days. It goes on to say, saying with a loud voice. Now, last time we uh, recalled that the first and third angel's messages are proclaimed with a loud voice, whereas the second angel simply says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And the reason we saw for that was because of the spiritual lukewarmness of the church. Uh, this was depicted by Jesus himself in Revelation 3 and verse 17, where he says, Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. However, the message of the second angel will be proclaimed with a loud voice according to Revelation 18, 1 and 2, where we find, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean, and hated bird. It goes on in verse 9 to say, If any man worships the beast. Now, beasts we know are symbols for national governments or other ruling powers. And the beast that is the third angel, uh, that the third angel is referring to here is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. And we find that uh, depicted in Daniel 7, 23, where it says, For the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom. So we know that beasts represent a kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other uh, kingdoms. And I think that Dr. Clark did a really good job last week in depicting how this beast was different from all the rest. Do you remember how we learned that the Romans did not go in to conquer as others had done? They did so with diplomacy, with policy, and with rhetoric. And now there are several identifying marks of that first beast, which are found in Revelation 13 that I'd like to look at. First and foremost, we can learn that it arose out of the sea. It has seven heads and ten horns. Upon its heads are the name, the names of blasphemy. Its power, seat, and authority come from the dragon. It received a deadly wound that was healed. And it continued for 42 months. So, first and foremost, we need to make sure that we let everyone know that the prophecy of that is speaking, not speaking against individuals of the Catholic Church, for there are many in the church who love the Lord and who are living up to all the truth that they know. The purpose of this prophecy is to expose the false religious system that Satan is using in these last days to deceive the world. And with that, we see that it warns against anyone who worships the beast and his image. Now, notice that the first beast, the papacy, as we found in Revelation 13, 1 through 10, is used 
has used secular and civil power to enforce her religious practices and beliefs. The power that would qualify as an image to the beast must therefore do the same thing. Because the increase of strife, crime, and natural disasters, many will believe here in America in these last days that it will be ruined unless Christianity, quote-unquote, is enforced. We know that this is going to be a false system of Christianity. And as conditions worsen, the people will press for a, a national Sunday law. We see enactments around the world already where it has been set up in many countries already, waiting, as we have told, been told in the spirit of prophecy, for the United States to enact this national Sunday law. And when the United States does so, then the rest of the world will follow, and we will be in our last moments of history. In Last Day Events, page 135, we read, When our nation in its legislative council shall enact laws to bind the conscience of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance, and bring operative power to bear against those who keep the seventh-day Sabbath, the law of God will in all intents and purposes be made void in our land, and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. Now notice, God depicts what will happen to those who take this mark in worshiping the beast and his image. It says, and receives his mark. So those who worship the beast and his image will receive a mark. The issue in these last days revolves around worship. And we keep the commandments of God or will keep the commandments uh, of the beast, one of the two. The true Christians at the very end of time will be characterized as keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. That's Revelation 14 and verse 12, as we'll see. And the mark of the beast is in opposition to the commandments of God and is a symbol of the beast's authority. How do we know this? Well, in Mark 7 and verse 9, Jesus said, All too well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your traditions. You know, I was reading an article recently. In fact, uh, it's the very next slide. I was reading this article from Catholic Records, September 1, 1923. If you haven't read this article, uh, you can go to the archives and find it online. I, uh, I recommend that you do so. The quote that is given here that the church is above the Bible, and this transfers, transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And it goes on to say that Catholics have a right to accept the observance of Sunday, but the Protestants have no biblical reason to do so. I thought, wow, why would that be? The writer goes on to say, because the Catholics believe that the unwritten word is as authoritative as God's written word. This is where the difference lies. When we give all authority to the beast, God is offended we must make sure that we hold true to the standards of the truth. However, I must make a confession before you. As I read this whole article, and I challenge you to do the same, the first part of this quote that was put on this slide is not there. 
Nowhere in the article could I find where it said Sunday is our mark of authority. It was said elsewhere, but not in this article. And so we must be sure that we know when we see slides pop up and quotes put up, that we, we mark them, we check them, we make sure that what we're saying is right. Because if the foundations are not right and we have nothing to back it with, uh, then we will find ourselves weak in the end and we will not make it all the way through. Because if you bring this quote as it stands today to the court of law against the Catholic Church, they'll prove you wrong. I just wanted to make that observation. However, the Sunday law will be made. And they say that the transfer of Sabbath to Sunday is proof that they have authority because it has been accepted by all the Protestant nations. Verse 9 goes on to say that the mark will be received in his forehead or in his hand. Now this mark being in the hand or in the forehead, indicates that not only one's labor, the hand, but also one's belief, the forehead, is affected. The phrase designates two classes of people, those who submit to the decrees of the beast, merely from expediency, and those who do so from personal conviction. Verse 10 goes on to say, He himself shall also drink he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation now notice that those who drink the wine of Babylon's fornication will finally and ultimately drink the wine of the wrath of God which are the seven last plagues we find this in Revelation 15 and verse 7 then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And we know that these bowls full of the wrath of God depict the coming seven plagues. Verse 10 goes on to say, And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. In addition to the seven last plagues, the worshipers of the beast receive their final punishment at the end of the millennium. Revelation 20, verses 7 to 9, tell us, Now when the thousand years were expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, if I have a sandwich and I devour it, is there anything left? Maybe a little bit of taste in my mouth, right? When God's final wrath is poured out, they will be wiped out along with sin forever. Can I get an amen? You know, verse 11 goes on and tells us, verse, in verse 9, it warns against the worship of the beast in his image. And verse 10, it tells us what will happen to those who do so. And verse 11, it goes on to tell us what the, will be the effects of what happens. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. See, the figure of the smoke ascending forever is drawn from Isaiah 34 and verse 10, where the smoke of Edom's destruction is described as ascending forever. In other words... The results of fire, the smoke, will be forever. So it's the punishment, not the punishing, that will last forever. The Bible is clear, 
and the uh, destruction of the wicked is forever. And we can use any of the uh, shown verses, but I chose just Malachi 4 and verse 1 because I believe that all we need is the one. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, we may have some farmers here. In North Carolina, at the end of the, of the season, when all the, all the uh, tobacco is picked and there's nothing but the stub, the stubble that's there, left over, is burned. And you, drive, you can drive by one of those fields when the farmer lights that field on fire and you can feel in your car the heat coming from that fire. It's hot. And when that fire goes through the field and it's done, as it says here in the Bible, there is neither root nor branch. The stubble is gone and it burns right down to the roots in the ground, sterilizes the ground, and then the farmer comes in, turns that in, and starts over again. Likewise, God will cleanse the earth in the end. Amen. It goes on and says in verse 11, And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. In the final destruction of the wicked, each person is rewarded according to their works. The duration of punishment prior to death will not be the same for everyone. Now, someone may be thinking, the second death is the second death. It's got to be the same for everyone, right? But if we look in Luke 12, verses 47 and 48, Jesus himself was very clear. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed the things deserving stripes shall be beaten with few. He's in our God a just God. You will be rewarded according to your works. And in great controversy, 673, we read about the one who will suffer the longest. It says, some are destroyed in a moment, while the others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. The sins of the righteous have been transferred to Satan. He is made to suffer not only for his own rebellion, but for all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit. His punishment is to be far greater than that of those whom he has deceived. And so, he's just, what he's doing in deceiving the nations and letting them think that they're in Christ and going along their way is only to try and shorten his sentence. And yet, justice will be served. Verse 12 then goes on to tell us, we've looked at the warning against false worship. We've looked at the uh, punishment for false worship. We've looked at the effects of that punishment. And now, verse 12 goes forward to tell us, here is the patience of the saints. Every attempt will be made to force the remnant to join the movement promoted by the beast, including the threat of boycott and death. And at the same time, Satan will with all deceivableness and unrighteousness make it appear that the power of God is manifest in the movement. Through all this, the faithful remnant steadfastly endure and maintain their integrity to God. 2 Thessalonians 9 and verse 10 tells, 
2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10 tell us, the coming of the lawless one according to the work of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so for those who do not make it, it is because they chose not to. Verse 12 goes on to say, Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Led captive by Satan's delusions, the world will bow to the beast in its image and carry out its di dictates and decrees. And yet the saints, on the other hand, refuse to comply with his demands. The special point of controversy will be the fourth commandment. Will you worship God or man? And it continues by saying, they not only keep the commandments, but and the faith of Jesus. Now, if you keep something, can you keep it if you've never had it? No. So this verse tells me that in order to be God's last day people, we must not only keep the commandments of God, which we've learned at Sabbath school that we can only do through the power of his indwelling, but we must also keep the faith of Jesus, which we must have in order to overcome. The faith of Jesus and the keeping of the commandments represent two important aspects of the Christian living. The commandments of God are the transcript of his character and the faith of Jesus allows Christ to live out his life within the believer. And verse 13 goes on to say, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Now this one... Uh, this is one of the seven Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. Death is not usually considered a blessing. Most people see death as the enemy. But for those who live and have faith in Christ, death is but a sleep that will end at the second coming of our Lord. And so, Jesus said to her, and John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live again. Everyone here should have said amen. That is the blessed hope, folks. Have we heard it so much that we don't even let it affect us anymore? Though we may die, we shall live again if we're found in Christ Jesus. And yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. You see, the world might forget the good that a person has done, but God will never forget. It is written in the books of heaven. And though the pro through the prophet Isaiah... God asks, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Praise the Lord. He has shown his love on the cross. And so now we've looked verse by verse line by line, through the three angels' messages, into what the, the, the world should hear and see in our lives. And we looked at what the main issue in the last day is, and we've seen that there is only two classes in the end. But how do we make ourselves a part 
in that remnant group in the end? Is it enough to hear and understand what these messages say? Or do we need to apply them in our lives to be saved? You see, folks, I think too many Adventists have taken pride in being an Adventist. We know the three angels' message. We know what's going to be proclaimed. We know what's going to happen. But are we ready? Can we quote the three angels' messages? Maybe. Maybe somebody here can. But can somebody else quote them through our life? That's what matters. So this is where I come to the sermon. All the introduction is done. And now we're getting to the sermon. You see, in this quote in early writings, I was reading, it shocked me when I first saw it, how it stood out to me finally. She says, I was shown three steps. The first, second, and third angels' messages. Said my accompanying angel, Woe to him who shall move a block or stir a pen of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. And so we see the three angels' messages as three steps leading towards something. And we are told that it is vital importance that we understand these messages. Not just to know them that, and that they exist, but to truly understand the meaning of them and apply them in our lives. And she goes on to say that the destination of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. Now, you may know the three angels' messages, but have you received them? This is what really matters. And so we go forward, and she continues. She says, I was shown again, I was again brought down through these messages and saw how dearly the people of God had purchased their experience. It had been obtained through much suffering and severe conflict. God had led them along step by step until he had placed them upon a solid, immovable platform. Now, do we have an understanding of what our forefathers went through leading us to the revealing of these truths that we hold so dear today? Many Adventists coming into the church today have no clue of Adventist history. And the importance of it has been brushed aside all that matters is I'm baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church and I'm going to heaven. But that's not the facts, folks. What, what our forefathers went through was nothing compared to the kidney stone I passed this week. And let me tell you, I was begging God, either take this thing away or take me out. I can't take it, Lord. Give me strength. Give me faith. Help me to hold on. It was a kidney stone. About that big. But our forefathers went through much, much more. And so we see these three steps are leading up to a platform on which God's people are to be standing. Now let's look at a quote that will describe for us just what those foundational pillars are that would hold up this platform of truth. Notice, it says, The passing of the time of 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary, transpiring in heaven, and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. Also, the first and second angels' messages and the third unfurling the banner on which 
was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of them, one of the landmarks under the message was to the temple of God seen by his truth-loving people in heaven and the ark of the, containing the law of God. Three, the light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays into a pathway of the transgressors of God's law. And four, the non-immortality of wit, wicked is an old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. Here, Sister White lays it out. One, what was the message in 1844 about? The second coming. Two, the temple or sanctuary of Christ in heaven. Three, the Sabbath. And four, the state of the dead. Now, we see four main pillars to hold up this platform. If you want to remember them, it's very easy because they all start with an S, right? The second coming, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the state of the dead. And we are assisted to understand them by another S, the spirit of prophecy. And so let's look at what we have so far. We see that we have the second coming, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, and the state of the dead all holding up something on a firm foundation, which we are told there's no other foundation than Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. I saw you. And upon this is what is known as the truth as it is in Jesus. Leading up to that platform is the first, second, and third angel's messages. I would like to suggest to you that these three steps leading up to that platform are overlaid by the vision that on the upward path that was given to Sister White. You see, it too can be found in the book of early writings. In that vision, we see that she saw God's people and they were walking up a path that grew ever steeper and more and more narrow until they reached the top and nothing was left but their faith to hold on to. And this was symbolized by the long cords that they had to hold on to and to swing to the other side of the chasm into the heavenly land. But notice, those who don't accept the second coming, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, and the state of the dead don't have the platform of truth as it is in Jesus. And we are told that if we don't receive the first angel's message, we cannot receive the second or the third. And therefore, those who don't walk up the steps, if you will, will not reach the top of the platform of truth and therefore, they will not be able to reach the cords of faith. Is this message an important message? Brothers and sisters, we don't realize just how important it is. Likewise, those who do not embrace the three angels' message will not have faith. You see, these green cords represent faith. And therefore... They will not have a way to enter heaven. Oh, I've got my faith in Jesus. You could ask the average Christian and they'll tell you, I have faith in Jesus. That's all I need. Is this message important? I'd say so. You see, without faith, we will never get through the great time of trouble. And our feet must be placed firmly on the truth as it is in Christ Jesus to have faith that works. And now I would like to look at how these four pillars relate to each other, other to each other and make uh, a conclusion that maybe we can understand why these pillars are what holds up the platform of truth. 
You see, I believe that most of us here will understand what the Sabbath is or what the second coming is, but do we understand how they relate to each other? Let's take a look. The state of the dead and the Sabbath, how do they relate to each other? Well, the state of the dead tells us that man has no life in himself. Genesis 3, 19, and etc. And we are but dust with breath in our nostrils that can do nothing without Christ. Amen? The Sabbath, on the other hand, tells us that God is our source of life. In six days, God created the hev heaven and the earth. And so where do we receive the fact that God is the source of our life, and yet we have no life within us? How can we balance that? Well, according to Colossians 3 and verse 4, Christ is our life. And this is what ties the Sabbath and the state of dead together. These doctrines are more than just saying that when we die, we sleep in the ground. You see, the doctrine of the state of the dead is key understanding on how we are saved. Because it is only when we believe that we have no inherent power of our own that we will look up to the giver of all life and life eternal for the power to overcome sin. You see, we can't do it on our own. And to not understand the Sabbath and the state of the dead is to not understand righteousness by faith, which is the true and everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages. The right understanding of these messages is of vital importance, that what we've read in the beginning of this presentation, the destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. That is what God is trying to get us to see. There is no life in man alone. In fact, let's look at these two diagrams, and what difference does it make what you believe about this? You see, if God gives man life source within himself, and a crisis comes, where will we look for the power to overcome? To ourselves, right? I can do it. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. I just have to try a little harder. But what does the doctrine of the Im immortality of the soul do to righteousness by faith? You see, it causes you to look to yourself for the power to overcome. And then when you can't overcome on your own, you have to say, well, Jesus covers all our sins and we can just go on sinning till he comes. See, once saved, always saved is that lie. Whereas over here, over here, oh, brothers and sisters, over there, we have no life outside of God himself, and we are driven to our knees to worship and honor him alone. We find power to overcome through Christ and then give him all the praise and the glory for the victory. You see, those who overcome will have believed the Sabbath, and they will have believed the state of the dead. They will have kept the law through Christ alone. You see, over here, you've, got the, you've been given the, the reward of life and, and power on your own. Do it yourself. But over here, we are reliant continually on God's life source to do anything. No good is within us unless Christ is there to do it. So now notice, this quote in Great Controversy 588. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under deception. 
Some will say, now how can you say that someone is deceived over what they believe on the issue of Sunday? Well, it goes a lot deeper than this. Because the Sabbath is a life source issue. You see, if you are not honoring him and worshiping him as creator, you are saying, I am my own source of life, and I do as I please, and I will worship when I please and how I please. But to keep the Sabbath day holy is to bow reverently unto the God of all universe that will give us the power to overcome and be victorious over sin. There's a big difference in the, in the way. And so here are those two pillars, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Babylon is built on these two pillars. Notice another statement. What they desire, she says, is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering him. Hmm. That twist. The papacy is well adopted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. You see, no need to keep the Sabbath because there's no need to be cleansed at all of our sins. Jesus took care of it at the cross. Right? All we need is justification. Jesus became our whipping boy. Hallelujah. Let's go home. No, folks. It's more than that. There must be, as was brought out Sabbath school week ago, that there must be a cleansing, a sanctifying work in the lives of those who are given over to the power of a loving God. And you don't even have to go to the Roman Catholic Church to hear stuff like this. It has come into our church as well. Not this church, but the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Heaven forbid. Satan is pulling out all the stops. Anything he can do to twist our mind or confuse us from what has been said, thus saith the Lord. And the true Sabbath keepers believe that God will give us the victory. Amen? And so then let's look at this. We have the immortality of the soul and Sunday observance. Immortality of the soul depicts that those who would be saved by their merits and Sunday observance are those who would be saved in their sins, according to the quote we just looked at. But notice, this means that one has self-reliance from a power within and that a, they have a denial of God's overwhelming power. So let's look at the opposite. With these pillars of truth, the soul, sleep, and resurrection, and the Sabbath observance, we see the following. A total dependence on God and a total trust in God's power. This is where our message differs from the world, the world of Christianity, because they have been led astray to the point that they have overcome already in their sins. That's the deception and lie of the, of the, of the enemy. And so now it looks at, at the next two pillars. What about the sanctuary and the second coming? How do they relate? Well, the sanctuary and the second coming focus our attention on the timetable of the plan of salvation. You see, the sanctuary message takes us step by step through the plan of salvation and the imminence of the second coming reminds us that we are living in a time of the end. And so, have you ever heard someone say, 
well, Jesus might not come another 20 or 50 or 100 or 500 years. We don't know the day or the hour. What does that have to do with their need to get ready? It cancels it completely. You cannot call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist and say, well, we don't know how long it's going to be. It might be 500 years. You see, the second coming is part of the name of the church. Seventh-day Adventist. We believe of the imminent return of Jesus. And if we wait any longer, it's because of us, not him. What does that do to your need to get ready? Or for their need to afflict their souls in the day of atonement. You see, folks, those two pillars make us focus on the times that we are living in. And if you're not focused on the time you're living in due to the distractions of everything else that wants to take your attention and your time away, I admonish you, look at the pillars that hold up the platform of truth. Make a change. Make a devotion to God. That's more than your five minutes in the morning. A full devotion to God. And see if it doesn't make a difference in the way you see things. Now, when we have an understanding of the sanctuary service, and we see that we are, are in the end of time, we see that the second coming is just around the corner and we are drawn to our knees once again. We have to ask the Lord to cleanse us and prepare us so that we can live not to the second coming, but through the second coming. Not to get into heaven, but to fit into heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is our message. The whole basis and meaning of the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be a movement going towards a fixed point in time. You see, we get our timetable from the sanctuary and the second coming of Christ. And so, let's tie all four of these together and see what we've got in reference to that first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him. State of the dead. The hour of his judgment is come. The sanctuary. Worship him that made heaven and earth. The Sabbath. The hour of his judgment is come. The second coming. We know that after the judgment is set, then Jesus will come. And soon that judgment will go from the dead to the living, we know not when, maybe today, and soon after, we shall see our Lord a coming. And just to make the final point, the very name Seventh-day Adventist tells us that we believe in a life source and we are living on a timetable, right? So go forth and be proud to tell the people that you are not an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist. There's a difference. And I'm here to tell you, those Adventists are the enemy's attack on the Seventh-day Adventist church. Hold true to the foundations of our faith. So let's recap what we've learned. We have four pillars of truth that hold up as it is, the platform of truth as it is in Jesus. And the only way to that platform of truth is through the application of the three angels' messages in our lives. And no other church has this message, folks. We've been called for a purpose in these last days. I've shown you the quote several times. Testimonies, volume 9, page 19. We are to allow nothing else to absorb our time. And yet, we get caught up in preaching on so many crazy things. 
let us focus on what the Lord would have us to do to finish the work because as was stated out in the foyer this morning, he's coming whether we're ready or not. You can either be with him or without him. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut from them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into a connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warning ever sent by God to man have been committed to them, that's you and I, to be given to the world. We're so privileged to have and know and understand these messages. But if we hoard them to ourselves, we're not going either. You see, the only way you can, can be right with God is to be a soul winner. I had an old friend from Raleigh challenge me on a post that I put on Facebook recently. But brothers and sisters, you can pay all the tithes you want to pay. You can be listed in as many Seventh-day Adventist churches as you want as a member. You can come every Sabbath. You can be involved in every ministry of the church. You can do everything you want to call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist in good standing. But if you're not a soul winner, if you don't have a love for the people in the world to go forth and to spread this message, you're not right with God. And if we don't have something in common with Jesus, do you think we'll be in heaven? There's only two things you can take to heaven with you. Your character, which better reflect the character of Christ, and convert. It can only be one through the power of Christ in you and through you to the world around you. Let us be in prayer that we get this thing right, brothers and sisters. Are you standing on the platform of truth? That's the question today. Are you standing on the platform of truth? Because Jesus is wrapping up things in the heavenly sanctuary. And soon he will come as king of kings and lord of lords. And if you are not standing on that platform of truth, you will not be able to hold to the faith of Jesus and you will not make it to your final home. Let that not be said of anyone in this church. This is my appeal to you today. Let us acknowledge it by singing our closing hymn. For